Let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll get started. Father, I want to thank you because you are life, and I want to thank you that we have found you, and I ask, Father, today that as we talk about discovering your will for our life after we find you, that you would speak to our hearts through the story of Esther. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When I was a little boy, I wanted to be many things. I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted to be a radiologist and an Indian. My friend Harold wanted to be an Indian as well, and I wikied the proper term for Native American, and uh, there, it's very much debated, so I'm going to go with Indian this morning. And uh, so, because both of us had Cherokee ancestry in us, uh, we decided that we were going to play Indian. And so, when Harold came over that afternoon, I had on my Indian outfit, which consisted of jeans and a t-shirt, but Harold said, oh no, we cannot play Indian in jeans and a t-shirt. And I said, well, what are we supposed to play Indian in? And Harold said, well, when I'm at home, I get a belt and I, I wear a loincloth. And I said, well, um, okay, you know, what, what is that? And he said, well, does your mom have any washcloths? And I, I said, yes. And so he, uh, he got two washcloths for each of us, and uh, we each had a belt. And so um, I put my washcloths, I tucked them into my belt over my jeans. Harold chose to only wear the washcloths and the belt. And so we go outside in the backyard to play, and our neighbor comes by and says, what are you doing? You can imagine the look on his face. And Harold looks at him and simply says, we are Indians. <laughs> what are you longing to be? We don't know when her parents died. Her uncle, Mordecai, uh, raised her. Her father's name was Abigail. Imagine growing up without your mother and father. For some of you, that may not be too much of a stretch of the imagination. Some of you may have lost a mother when you were young. Some of you, your father may have walked out before you could walk. Maybe you lost your parents in your teenage years. Whatever the case, you know how Esther was feeling. Did she look more like her mom or her dad? Did her mom have any secret family recipes? Did her dad have a special way to make her laugh? What were her parents' dreams for her? She didn't know, and she never would. How could she know where she was going if she didn't know where she came from? Most of us, myself included, don't know our parent as well as we should. And because we don't know completely what his plans are for us, maybe we've tried to guess his plans, Maybe we've read about his plans for other people and tried to adapt them to our story. Maybe we think we know what his plans are for us, and we're following them to the best of our ability. But what do we know about God's dreams for us? Do we know what he is longing for us to be? William longed to be. He longed to find a place in life, his place in life, a place that was all his own, a place where he had a purpose. But the age of 32, his failure at life up to that point was harder than he could bear. It was a different time than today, and 32 was already into middle age. He finally decided to take matters in his own hands, and he hired a taxi driver to take him to the bridge on the Thames River. The taxi driver didn't know William, but he realized what William intended to do as William stood on the edge of the bridge, and the taxi driver grabbed the back of his coat and hauled him back in the taxi and took him home. That night, when William got home, back and alone, he took some poison 
but a neighbor found him and provided an antidote before he was able to die. Discouraged, that same night, William fell on a knife, but the blade broke. And so, William decided that he would hang himself, and he did. Early the next morning, he hung himself. But before he died, a neighbor found him and cut him down. Because of the unfathomable, unsearchable, uh, inscrutable power of God, invisible though it was, William Cowper was unable to take his own life, although he tried four times in one night. And now, alive, 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 and alive again, he longed to be more than ever. When Esther was in her mother's womb, God had a plan for her life. Open your Bibles this morning. We'll have it on the screen as well. But if you have a Bible, open it to the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 7. It's an amazing story that takes place. Uh, Esther is a contemporary of uh, the chest and arms of silver that some of us know of in the, in the image of Daniel chapter 2. Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, he ruled from India all the way to Ethiopia. In chapter 2, verse 7, we read, Esther had been a father to Hadassah, or excuse me, Mordecai had been a father to Hadassah, that is Esther, though she was really his cousin, because she had neither father nor mother. The girl had a beautiful figure, and was lovely to look at. When her parents died, Mordecai had taken her to be his daughter. Did you catch that? Esther had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. She was gorgeous. The Hebrew word that describes Esther's beauty is mare, which literally means phenomenon of outward beauty, phenomena of outward beauty. She was gorgeous. This afternoon, with a little bit more laid-back crowd, I'll probably say that she was hot. She was a beauty. And God had given her that beauty because it was part of His plan for her life. He knew that she would have to attract the attention of the most beautiful, most powerful man in the entire world. King Ahasuerus, the chest and arms of silver, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the, the second most wealthy, powerful kingdom that has ever been. God created Esther to attract the king's attention. Let's go to verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. When the king's order and his new law became public, and we're talking now about uh, he, he wants his queen, in chapter 1 he find out that he wants his queen Vashti to come dance nude before the men at his party. She says no, so he deposes her as king, and now he's looking for a new queen. And when the king's order and his new law became public, many young women were gathered into the fortified part of Susa under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken to the place to the care of Haggai, the one in charge of the women. The young woman pleased him and won his kindness. He quickly began her beauty treatments and gave her carefully chosen foods. He also gave her seven servants selected from among the palace servants and moved her and her servants into the nicest rooms in the women's house. I want to tell you right now that the Bible is full of people who are faithful to God that are very vastly different in their interpretations of what faithfulness looks like. Daniel, what was he faithful for? Well, he was faithful because, you know, he ate, didn't eat the king's food, he didn't drink the king's 
wine. He, he wanted to eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. Why was Esther faithful? Well, Esther was faithful because she went to the spa for a year, ate all of the food they gave her, no matter what it was, and slept with the king before they got married. That's, why Esther, that's how Esther was faithful. Do you understand that the Bible is a story where faithfulness to God counts so much more than our small minds can comprehend? Have you ever thought about that? I think it's something we should think about. So Esther's going to the palace. She goes to the spa. She participates like she's supposed to. And she did not tell anyone her race, her family background, because she was obedient to her father, her uncle, Mordecai, and he had told her, do not tell anyone who you are or what your nationality, what your race is. Verse 10, Esther hadn't told anyone her race and family background because Mordecai had ordered her not to. Each day found Mordecai pacing back and forth along the wall in front of the woman's house to learn how Esther was doing and what they were doing with her. So Mordecai, who has raised this young girl, knows her beauty, loves her as his daughter, has raised her as a daughter. We know from the story, he works at the palace. He understands a little bit of of what takes place at the palace. And he is passing back and forth in front of the harem where they're giving these women the beauty treatments. And he is just wondering what is happening to his little girl. Can you imagine, as a father... You're one of your daughters being ordered to go into the harem of the king, and once she's in, she will not come out. Ever. The king doesn't choose his queen and then let the other girls go home. No, in this culture, the king gets them all, and they just stick around for when he may want them from time to time. Or whoever gets it, but you don't know that your daughter is going to get it, and the one that gets it is going to have wealth and power, but she's also going to have a great responsibility because you also know that if the king wants her to come do something for him or his friends and she doesn't want to, she's going to get her head cut off. It's not a very comfortable place to be. It's not a very clean story. It's much different than those blue books that if you were raised in Avenus, you were read to as a kid. And so Mordecai's wondering, what's going to happen to my little girl? Let's go to verses 15 through 17. Soon the moment came for Esther, daughter of Mordecai's uncle, Abihail, who Mordecai had taken as his own daughter, to go to the king. But she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, in charge of the women, told her. Esther kept winning the favor of everyone who saw her. The question now is, is it possible to live your life in a way that you grow up believing is immoral, but a way that God calls you to live in a way that remains, that keeps you faithful to God? I remember when I was a young pastor, and I wanted to share a little bit about Paul's text. You know, that last passage in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we call the love chapter, and Paul says, now we see but through a glass dimly. The first riot I ever created in a church is when I stood up and told the church, you know, there really is no black and white. Everything is gray. See, Paul talks about it. Oh, they didn't want to hear that. Life's supposed to be easier than that, isn't it? I don't see that in Scripture. I see people that are faithful in the circumstance that God has placed them in. And they're faithful only through His grace to the best of their ability. Verse 16, Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his own palace in the tenth month, that is the month of Tevet, in the seventh year of his rule. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. She had won his love and his favor more than all the others. We already talked about how she did that. 
He placed the royal crown on her head and made her ruler in place of Vashti. So Ahasuerus is overwhelmed by Esther's beauty. He spends the night with her, and the next day he's satisfied she's going to be his queen, and that's it. Esther is now the queen of the most powerful king of all of the kingdoms of the world at that time. In the right place, at the right time, to save God's people because God had a plan for her life. God had a plan for Esther's life. And the beauty about Esther's story is that no matter where you are in your life today, no matter how moral you are, no matter what your sin is, God has a plan right now, today, for your life too. Still suffering from acute depression and mental stress, verging on insanity, William Cowper gave more and more and more and more of his life to Jesus Christ. Later, he struck up a friendship with a man named John Newton. Eventually, them, eventually, the two of them collaborated and published a collection of hymns called The Only Hymns, in which Newton released his best-loved hymn, Amazing Grace. Thirteen years after his four suicide attempts, Cowper himself began writing hymns, and he wrote 67 of them, including this one. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his brightest designs and works his sovereign will. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. God's plan for your life puts a smile on His face. Turn, if you have your Bible still open, to Psalm chapter 139. 139, and David wrote this one. We've talked the last two weeks about being found. Once you are found by God, this is what God does to you. Verse 1 of chapter 139, David writes, Lord, you have examined me. You know me. Nine years ago, a good friend of mine challenged me that I didn't know God's plans for my life like I should. It was, it was a good challenge. And that challenge started me on a journey to spend time with God every day. Sometimes at this point in my life, nine years later, I think it's probably the only thing that I'm good at. But I am good at it. In fact, this summer, most of you know, I built a little cabin in my backyard, and the purpose of that cabin is for me and God to spend time together. My wife's allowed in it. My kids, only a little bit. No one else. No one else. Why? Because it's my place for God and me to meet together. It took me about three months, two months, to figure out a name for the place. I'm going to share the name with you, but you'll never see inside unless you want to look at pictures. The name is Masay. It's the Hebrew word for refuge. The majority of time in Scripture, God refers to that refuge as himself, but it actually does refer to refuge as a place as well. It has a double meaning. So now in my life, that's what I'm the most good at is spending time with God, listening to Him, doing what He tells me to do, sharing with those in 
my congregation, those that he's asked me to lead, that he wants us to raise 15 million, not 15, well, that would be a lot of money, $3 million in 15 months. I took that challenge, and for the last nine years, I've done that. I haven't been perfect at it, but I've found God, and consequently, I let Him find me. Search for God. Let Him find you. God has a plan for your life. God knows what you are longing to be, and He will tell you as you listen. Let's pray. Father, our Father, thank you for searching us and knowing us. And I ask that you would reveal who you know us to be to ourselves as we find you and let you find us. Thank you for the story of Esther that brings us hope that we can be used by you even in places that we think are unusable because no place and no person is unusable to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.